My name is Paul Klein, and on behalf of the Graduate School of Social Work Diversity Committee, the Independent Student Diversity Groups, and the GSSW Alumni Association, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this morning's conference exploring the intersections of spirituality and social work practice. It's really a remarkable and really quite wonderful morning for us. Although many voices and many hands have contributed to the content and structure of this morning's conference, it's been primarily shaped and formed and fueled by the imagination, wisdom, and energy of our students. Almost one year ago today, student leaders sat with us for our initial exploratory conversation, and from that moment on, they have been full and enthusiastic partners in bringing us to this morning. It's good, therefore, that we start this day by recognizing their efforts, and in particular, the efforts of three student leaders who have served as our visionaries. And so I invite Beth Glauber, Emily Hankel, and Kat Chapman to stand and receive our expression of gratitude. Thanks, guys. Thank you. It's also, I think, important to acknowledge that it's not so easy to build an academic community where student voices really matter and where students are truly empowered to participate in shaping the mission, goals, and day-to-day -day activities that impact their professional and personal development. So I ask that we also begin this morning by thanking Dean Gadenzi for his leadership and for his enthusiastic and unwavering commitment to our diversity objectives and to building community. Alberto, thank you. Beth Glauber graduated last year with a master's degree in both social work and pastoral ministry, and this conference is just one expression of the deep imprint she has made on our school. And we're pleased to welcome her back home and to introduce and to ask her to introduce our keynote speaker, Beth. In reviewing the academic and professional accomplishments of Dr. Ed Kanda, you are quickly captured by the impression of witnessing a personal and professional journey of great depth. Dr. Ed Kanda graduated summa cum laude from Kent State University with a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology. Following graduation, he studied as a graduate fellow in East Asian philosophy at Sung Hyun Kwan University in Seoul, Korea. Following his fellowship, he was awarded a Master of Arts in Religious Studies from the University of Denver. Dr. Kanda received both his MSW and PhD in Social Welfare from Ohio State University. During this time, he focused his study and practice on cross-cultural and spiritual issues. Since 1999, Dr. Kanda has held the position, the position of professor in the School of Social Welfare at the University of Kansas, where he also holds an appointment as courtesy professor in the Department of Religious Studies. Dr. Kanda is the founder of the Society for Spirituality and Social Work in the United States, and his remarkable record of publications and professional presentations around the world speak to his reputation as the most enduring and most welcome voice speaking about spirituality and social work in our profession. In meeting Dr. Kanda, even briefly, it is clear that he not only studies and practices, but also lives out a commitment to spirituality and service. Please welcome Dr. Ed Kanda. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. And uh, thanks also especially to Paul Klein for working with me to arrange all of this and to the Dean for sponsoring this. Uh, I think that your school is showing a lot of uh, creativity and uh, vision in supporting this event, especially on your 75th anniversary year, because this topic, whereas it had been largely ignored in our profession for much of its history, has really been flourishing lately, and it's, it's blossoming in the United States and in many other countries. So what you're doing here, I think, is connecting at a very good time where there's a lot of momentum. So in my presentation, uh, since it's fairly brief, I'd like to give you an overview of some key uh, values 
and ideas around spiritually sensitive social work, opening up for some discussion that you might continue in workshops. In my workshop, I'll be focusing uh, on the international aspects of connecting around this topic, and I'll give an example from doing a study abroad course in Korea. So it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to suggest as I get started that you just reflect for a moment on what brings you here. Uh, is it because of a particular interest around spirituality um, or not, perhaps just curiosity? Um, is there anything about your personal background or your professional work that has piqued your interest? And does it connect with any of your professional work and commitments? Uh, there's some theme about that that will flow through the presentation as well. How to make some uh, parallel process between our personal spiritual growth and our professional work and how to link those up. So in some of my slides I'm going to have mandala images. Uh, I've designed these partly just for fun. I like to do it because I enjoy it. But mandalas are a good example of a kind of design that has both uh, each one its own unique particular appearance, but also it has a kind of universal quality to it. So mandala is a word from Sanskrit. It simply means circle or wholeness. Uh, a mandala is a symbol that usually has circular or square and com or combined with circle shape that represents some way of understanding diverse aspects of the world and how they connect in harmony and unity. Uh, so as Carl Jung, the, the famous uh, Swiss depth psychologist, had pointed out, you can find uh, mandala-type designs all over the world in many cultures and religions. Uh, for example, the term coming from Sanskrit, it's not surprising, mandalas are important in Hindu and Buddhist traditions. Uh, paintings and meditation diagrams are made in this shape. Also in the Christian tradition, uh, rose windows of stained glass are very common, and those are maybe sometimes are geometrical and often they have religious images in them to help give a sense of, of connection and focus. Also Native American medicine wheel designs are similar to mandalas and they represent how different directions, cardinal directions and the center, all uh, represent different aspects of the human life cycle, of nature, and how all of these things can be brought together in harmony. So I'm going to weave some mandalas through to help to illustrate uh, my points. <coughs> so I'm approaching this topic in the talk as a social worker, and I'm, I'm glad to know that people here are from a variety of fields, and, and also that you have a good partnership here between uh, theological studies and ministry and social work. That's great. But as a social worker, I want to start out making clear that my approach to this topic uh, is coming from professional values, uh, mission, and, and ethics. Of course, that's congruent with uh, those, especially of the pastoral counseling field. But, um, you know, really in social work audiences, sometimes when this subject comes up, people become alarmed oh my goodness, what's he going to do? Is he going to try to convert us to his, his own belief system? Is, uh, are we going to become uh, indoctrinated to a certain religious position or, or whatever? So some people have allergic reactions to this topic still in our field, actually. And it's helpful to start out by basing clearly what I mean by this in terms of our professional mission and values. So we say, in a broad sense, social work is dedicated to advance the fulfillment of all people in the context of social justice. What I'm going to present this morning is, is uh, a way, I think, of bringing the potential of that ideal even further than is commonly thought of in social work. So one way it does that, we often say we want a holistic person and environment view, but I found that many times when social workers say that, they may refer to biopsychosocial, but there's nothing about spiritual. In fact, earlier in, in my time, when I was in my MSW program, that was in the very early 80s, there was nothing about religion or spirituality. And I found that very strange, actually, because coming from cultural anthropology, I knew that 
uh, religion in the broad sense of the term is present in every culture, so how can you understand cultural diversity without dealing with that somehow? So this is really expanding the notion of the, the whole person to biopsychosocial, spiritual, and also in terms of our relationships with the environment, uh, having, uh, including perspectives on the environment that are spiritual in nature, like deep ecology and ecofeminism. Appreciation for diversity. Here this morning I'm focusing on spiritual diversity, but spiritual diversity intersects with many other aspects of human diversity as well. And that's where there's a lot of richness, a lot of, uh, a lot of enjoyment from those connections, but also sometimes controversy points. Uh, also, I am committed to the NESW Code of Ethics and international standards, like through the International Federation of Social Workers. Uh, by the way, these international standards are emphasizing also culturally appropriate practice, uh, non-oppressive, non-discriminatory practice, and religion and spirituality are increasingly being understood, not only in the U.S., but in many other countries in that context. So spiritually sensitive social work addresses the ways that clients and their communities are seeking to fulfill their highest aspirations, seek a sense of meaning, purpose, and connectedness, and to maximize their strengths and resources and overcome obstacles and to deal with environmental blocks and gaps and resources. That sounds a lot like typical social work maybe, but one of the key themes here is this searching for a sense of meaning, purpose, and connectedness across many fields of uh, the helping professions, this theme of meaning, purpose, and connectedness is central to the understanding of spirituality. And of course, social workers deal with that frequently, but it often happens as well that in our day-to-day -day work, and even in a lot of our research, we become more uh, concrete-oriented and task-oriented, and may not look at the bigger picture of how the issues we're dealing with play into the client's larger sense of life purpose and meaning. Before I say more at an abstract level, I want to give you an example. During the 1980s, most of my practice and research related to Southeast Asian refugee resettlement. And just one story from that, at this time I was a professor at University of Iowa and I was, had a contract with the uh, State Bureau of Refugee Resettlement, working with uh, uh, training for agencies for culturally appropriate work with refugees. Well, so because of that, I was known by various uh, resettlement providers and sponsors. And at one point, there was a Methodist minister who gave me a call. He worked for a congregation that was sponsoring quite a few uh, refugees in their resettlement process. And he said, uh, Professor Kanda, I've got a situation I wonder if you can help me with. I uh, wonder uh, if you could come and meet me over at the apartment of one of uh, our uh, refugee members. He and his roommate are having this dispute, and I don't know how to deal with it. They're, they're angry at each other, they're arguing, and there's even some threat of violence. One of them says he has a knife and, you know, wondering what's going to happen. And he says, could you come over? I said, oh, sure, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Uh, well, I, I don't speak Lao, so I went with my assistant, who is uh, multilingual, so in that, uh, in the apartment, the, the minister and myself and the assistant and uh, another translator were there and the roommates, and we tried to talk through each side what was going on. In the course of that, the emotional intensity kept building. You could see the anger starting to come out, the, the interactions were, were escalating. Well, I realized I made one of the, the, the first mistakes, you, you, you know, people who are uh, well experienced in crisis situations know that you should always be close to an exit when you're in a situation like, oh my gosh, I'm in the farthest away from this. So, Well, one thing I noticed was as, as the attention was escalating, I was also getting more tense myself. My breathing was becoming constricted, my mind was starting to race, I'm checking the exit, etc. So I was starting to become distracted and my my assistant, a bilingual, bicultural uh, assistant, she was having a hard job because she was meeting all of this 
mediating all of this linguistically, which isn't just a language challenge in this point, but there is the emotional stuff going back and forth. So I could tell she was getting tense. I thought, what do I do about that? And I noticed that my glass of water was getting low. It's customary to offer guests something to eat or drink when visiting. So I thought, well, I need some water, but also if I ask for some water, it might make a break in the situation. So I did that very, very simply. Uh, one of the roommates went out to get some water. There was a pause. People kind of relaxed, started chatting more informally, came back. And so then we were able to kind of restart uh, working things through. With, so it stopped escalating. Well, that's very, very simple. Well, let me tell you a little bit more about that. So by the, by the end of the interaction, it turned out that part of what was going on was accumulated stressors that the roommates had, not just one little issue they were arguing about. You know, the combination of post-traumatic stress, cross-cultural -cultur transition stress, uh, etc. So one of the roommates uh, who was Buddhist, he said, you know, it would really help me out is if I could go spend some time at the local Lao Buddhist temple, uh, spend some time with the monks, rest, uh, meditate, be in a protected space, and so we talked about that, and, and the minister who was uh, his sponsor said, okay, that, sure, I can, I can help arrange that. And so that's what they did. So it not only helped de-escalate that one situation, but helped him to go to a space where he could uh, get some relaxation. And in, in those uh, uh, settings, the monks may welcome someone to stay with them and participate in meditation practice. And, uh, also, by the way, I noticed there's a, a, like a thread that runs around the perimeter of the temple space. And I was told that this is a kind of magical protection so that people go into the space and they feel that, it, that it's a, a sacred and protected space. So in that story, there are a couple of things I wanted to point out. One is the internal aspect. Aside from the usual social work skills of uh, mediating, just simply paying attention to what was happening with my breathing, with my own signs of stress, and what was happening with the other people in the group. And then being able to act on that in such a way to help people become refocused and recentered, that I think is an important ingredient of spiritually sensitive practice. The other part of it was on the larger environmental side being able to work out a collaboration between the cultural and religious beliefs and support systems of everyone involved so that they're complementary and mutually supportive. And fortunately, the Methodist minister in this case, he was very comfortable with that. So for him, it was fine. It, in fact, it was congruent with his vision of himself as a minister to help fill the need of this one Lao roommate to go spend time at the Buddhist temple. So on the good days, Religious and cultural differences can become a basis of multiple strengths, multiple resources that can be complementary and linked up. Now, I don't want to pretend it's always like that, because sometimes these differences are perceived as a matter of conflict and friction. But when that happens, I've noticed the process and outcomes tend to be less uh, successful. So this ties to some major ethical principles. Uh, first, we start with a focus on the consumer or client's beliefs, goals, interest, and comfort level. This isn't about the social worker's own religious or non-religious or anti-religious agenda. Just like other aspects of social work practice, we are assessing where the clients are at, how do we join with that, and how do we help fulfill their aspirations. And we're doing that in the context of a culturally appropriate manner. If we're using explicit spiritually based helping practices like prayer or meditation, for example, uh, in general, I think it's best to begin with the least intrusive approach. So for example, in assessment, start out with open-ended questions that aren't steering the person and aren't also closing down uh, options for the discussion, just to identify the consumer's level of interest. And then if it's appropriate, if you're cued that there's interest and it's relevant, to move to more explicit spiritually based practices, but again, only if, if the client indicates that's what they prefer. <clears throat> On a larger context, and this is sometimes more tricky, the organizational context of service delivery 
hopefully, would reflect these values and ethical principles and be spiritually sensitive in its administrative style and its policies. I say that can be more tricky because I've often found social work practitioners individually are committed to this and they're trying to figure out how to do it. But most social work practitioners have not had educational preparation, what to do and how to do it around this. And in the agency context, many agencies ignore it, haven't thought about it, haven't developed any policies or guidelines around it, don't have any assessment tools around it, and might even be giving messages to their workers, don't touch it. So if that's the environment, it makes it much harder uh, to be spiritually sensitive. Uh, however, then the social worker might have an opportunity to do advocacy and training in the agency to, to expand on that. So I use the word spirituality and religion, but I didn't tell you what do I mean by them yet. So before I go further, I want to give my definitions. My definitions are based on pulling together ideas from uh, initially from uh, in the 80s from a set of all the living social work scholars who were writing on the topic. I interviewed them and pulled, the, pulled their ideas together. And over the decades since then, pulling ideas from many disciplines, uh, social work, psychology, psychiatry, uh, medicine, nursing, uh, pastoral counseling, and such, and try to find some common themes and come up with a, a definition that seemed to capture that. But I have to tell you, there are actually many, many different definitions. They don't all agree with each other. Uh, but at least for our purposes, I want to say uh, what I mean by it. So spirituality, that kind of word is a process word. Spirituality is, is, is a process. So it's a process of human life and development, focusing on a search for a sense of meaning, purpose, morality, and well-being. So that's one key concept you find across many, many, many definitions. Secondly, it involves relationship building with oneself, other people, other beings, the universe, and ultimate reality, however understood. Well, ultimate reality, however understood, that's a mouthful, and that's a whole lot, too, because there's a whole lot of different ways it's understood. There are philosophical materialists, there are theists, there are, uh, there are uh, uh, polytheists, there are animists, there are et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and combinations of everything you can think of. So what, one thing a social worker has to do is be very open in terms of their uh, flexibility around worldviews, because when you're dealing with a wide range of clients, you're going to find a lot of things, some of which might really surprise you. Another theme is that spirituality orients us around centrally significant priorities. What is a, the kind of the central theme that, that's driving us in our life? And lastly, it engages a sense of transcendence, carrying us beyond our ordinary limited sense of, 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 of ego. So this means experiencing reality in some way as deeply profound, sacred, or transpersonal. To me, spirituality is the larger umbrella concept, and religion is a sub-concept. So if you imagine spirituality being like a large circle in a Venn di diagram and religion being a circle within it, so there are people who are religious and people who are not religious, but still spiritual and combinations. So by religion, what I mean is an institutionalized, that is systematic, systematized, organized pattern of values, beliefs, symbols, behaviors, and experiences that involves spirituality, but also a community of adherence. You can't have a religion of one person. A religion might start with one person, but only unless other people say, hey, that's a good idea, and they, they link up and form bonds and activities that continue over time, you don't have a religion. So that goes to the next thing. A religion involves transmission of traditions over time, which of course change over time as well, and community support functions of many types. Uh, coming out of their organizational structure, granting material assistance, emotional support, political advocacy, etc. Like for example with the refugee situation I mentioned, the Methodist uh, Church uh, was providing, helping to provide uh, an apartment, was providing uh, food, helping the, the, them to get settled in, and also invited them to their church services uh, if the refugees wanted to participate. By the way, that was an interesting issue <laughs> because in this case, uh, most of the refugees I worked with were Buddhist, 
Uh, some also uh, came from animistic backgrounds. Uh, some were influenced by Confucianism and some combinations of those. And most of the sponsors were from Christian denominations. So in some places, like this Methodist minister I mentioned, he saw those different systems as complementary. There is an open invitation to participate in the congregation, uh, and most did. But they also may go to the Buddhist temple, and from the refugees' point of view, they could interact and go between these. But sometimes it happened that the sponsors of the refugees basically insisted that they participate in religious functions, not just uh, open welcoming, but we want you to convert, and if you don't, we're going to be really upset. And that put the refugees <laughs> in a bind. Many told me, please don't tell my sponsors that I'm going to the Buddhist temple. They're going to be unhappy, and I'm going to feel bad. I'm so grateful to them, but they're going to get upset about it. And so they felt another layer of stress, and so they had to do hiding, and you know, that's, that's only added more unnecessary complications uh, to their cross-cultural adjustment. So in the United States, if you look at it demographically, the U.S. is one of the most religious countries in the world in terms of people who identify a belief in God and uh, have religious affiliations. Some other countries, it's not like that at all. So in, in, in many countries, if you're going to address spirituality, you have to make really clear we're not talking about religion and most people involved may not be religiously affiliated. <coughs> in this country, you can hardly address the topic without including spiritual uh, religion. And it makes sense. So a lot of things I'm going to say are going to connect with religions, but these other themes I mentioned, meaning, purpose, relationship, connectedness, transcendence, are not necessarily, they can be within religious contexts and may not be within religious contexts. So existential philosophy and existential social work, for example, highlights these themes, but it is not necessarily religious. All right, so here's another mandala. This is uh, one to help provide a conceptual framework to think about spirituality. So first, spirituality is an aspect of the person. It's been common for a long time to say biopsychosocial. Now it's becoming more common to say biopsychosocial spiritual to highlight this dimension that I'm talking about, not only in social work but in nursing and, and many other fields. <coughs> So that's kind of like looking at those four quadrants there as being slices of a pie. A person's a pie, we got four slices, we want the whole pie. Well, that's good, it's a tasty pie, we want to get that whole pie. Uh, that's good, that's holistic. However, um, while I think that's an advance over biopsychosocial, there's also something artificial about it. Human beings are not pies, we can't be sliced up. But sometimes we do that in, with our practice specializations and the way we think about people. Uh, in fact, one of the themes of spirituality, as I mentioned, is this search <clears throat> for uh, connectedness. That's happening within ourselves also. So this sorting out a sense of meaning and purpose, as we go through our lives, we're addressing ourselves that way as well as our relationships that way. So what about the biological psychological and psychological aspects of ourselves. What's the meaning and purpose of all that? And how does that, all of that play a role in who we are as a total person and our life purpose? Let me give you an example of that. Take something very, very nitty gritty, something very physical, something basic, something happens to everybody, something you can't escape. What do you think I'm going to say? <laughs> right? <laughs> or taxes, no. I think some people want us to get away from taxes, but death. Yeah, so, you know, there's, there's an old uh, Monty Python joke, if any of you remember the old British comedy group. They said uh, their definition of life. Life is a sexually transmitted terminal condition. <laughs> Hey, true, but if somebody said, you have a sexually transmitted terminal condition, oh my gosh, <laughs> sorry to break the news. <laughs> so, well, we, especially if we work in the fields of hospice, palliative care, grief counseling, loss, 
We know that when people face their own deaths or the deaths of loved ones, deep spiritual questions often come out, even if people haven't thought about it much before. Like, why is this person dying? Why is it happening to them? Why, why not me? Or why is this person dying so young or in such a tragic way? Or what happens after death or anything? Or how, do, how should we approach the death? Should there be a funeral? What kind? Et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> such a nitty gritty, and because it's inescapable and such a powerful fact of human life, it calls forth all these spiritual questions. So it doesn't make sense, I, I, and I think certainly in social work in those fields we recognize that it. it doesn't make sense to ignore the spiritual aspect there. But my, my larger point is that spirituality then has moved into that, that physical domain and the emotional aspects of that and the social relational aspects of dying and trying to make sense of it. So actually, as, again, as, as Jung pointed out, throughout the course of life, often, especially as people in middle age and older, we are looking more carefully at who we are as a whole person, how all of our aspects link up, how we can harmonize and, and balance that, at least hopefully, if, if someone is on a spiritual path. And by the way, in the aging field, <clears throat> um, this has come to be looked at more and more within the context of positive aging. And uh, Lars Tornstam uh, developed the, the theory of general transcendence that is, is focusing on elders who, the way I would put it is, th they're approaching uh, <clears throat> the latter period of life as a spiritual process. And so he describes features of uh, general transcendence that are much like Maslow a long time ago talked about uh, self-actualizing and self-transcending people. The next way I'd like to talk about is spirituality as center of the person. By the way, spirituality as aspect, that's the most common way you see it discussed in the professional and academic literature. And one reason is it can be made more concrete. And if we were talking about research, I could describe many ways that you can, you can look at features of spirituality that can even be operationalized and, and measured to some extent and other things that can't be measured but can still be studied. Uh, but I'm going to suggest two other metaphors that are more holistic, more metaphorical. So it's, we, we're not being reductionistic about it. Spirituality as center of the person. You know, actually, uh, the Chinese character for mind or heart refers to the shape of the heart. It refers to our center, that our mind is actually centered here. Um, the first time I was in Korea uh, initially as a student, I remember once in 1976, I was visiting a, <clears throat> a Buddhist temple and met a young monk a little bit older than myself at the time. We started chatting. and. Um, uh, at that time, I had long hair because I was a, a hippie type of guy. <laughs> and he had no hair because he was a monk. <laughs> and he was asking me, why do you have long hair? And I asked him why he had no hair. We found out it was for the same reason, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when we were talking about it, he, and we we're, we we're talking about mind or maom in, in Korean, when I used the word, I was pointing like this automatically. When he used it, he was pointing like this. And I just noticed, wait a minute, you're pointing somewhere else. And so I had some conversations uh, with Korean friends. And so I, I realized, OK, that makes sense. Actually, even in European history, the er earlier notion of the mind was rooted in, in the heart. But I point that out because uh, we, we have the common idiom to be centered. When a person is centered, there are some important things happening. So if, if you feel centered, if you were to say, I'm feeling centered now, what can you describe, could uh, some people toss out some ideas, what does it feel like to be centered? Peaceful. Peaceful? Balanced. Balanced. Grounded. Present, grounded. OK, good. So how about physically, what's happening in your body? Relaxed. Relaxed? What, how about your breath? probably slow or smoothly flowing. Uh, your thinking is probably clear or even quiet. Uh, actually, when, we when we're, we're talking about uh, good interviewing skills clinically or, or as a researcher, centering, though traditionally in social work people haven't called it that, would be really important. When you're more centered, your mind is clear, your breath is flowing smoothly, 
Um, you're not distracted, you're aware of your, yourself with the client in the situation in the moment, but you're not attached, you're not carried away, you're not lost in what's happening. That's a very important quality. Well, many traditions uh, of meditation and prayer and yoga and tai chi, etc., they look at, they, they teach ways to get more centered, even literally physically, how to pay more attention to the flow of the breath, how it moves through our central channel. And um, these kind of practices, even literally being centered, can help us to be emotionally and socially uh, centered. But that kind of centering is not egocentric, it's not narcissistic. When we're more centered, what's interesting is we're more open and connected with others. We can really hear and understand and have a rapport with the client. Whereas if our mind is racing with all of our assessments and judgments and checklists and eligibility criteria and emotional reactions and whatever, we're not really connected with that person anymore. Just like the situation I mentioned with the, the Lao roommates. Once I was able to recenter, it also helped with the process to recenter. And some traditions even talk about when you go into your true center, the true, your deep sense of your true self, you're connecting with your soul or your spirit or the divine within. <clears throat> uh, so uh, centering, centeredness or your center, I think, is another way of looking at spirituality that's helpful. We could go to the larger metaphor of spirituality as wholeness of the person. I wasn't planning on talking about Jung, but for some reason he keeps popping up. So Jung looked at the spiritual journey as a movement towards wholeness. As we work through different aspects of ourselves and, and our relationships, we may come to a sense of who we are as a whole person, not only as an individual, but in our relationships and our connectedness <coughs> with others. So ultimately, it's possible that our sense of wholeness transcends just oneself is a sense of you, your identity actually fully connected, integral with, even united with, with others, with the universe, uh, with God, uh, with uh, Buddha nature, with uh, Brahman, whatever the, the way of understanding it might be. So that sense of wholeness includes all of these aspects, but it also transcends them. So I just want to toss out those metaphors as a way of getting some more um, concrete way of thinking about spirituality and also some more metaphorical and expansive ways. I think compassion is an important ingredient in spiritually sensitive <coughs> social work. But sometimes that word is used uh, in a watered down way. What I mean by compassion is engaging life, self and relationships with passion. Literally, compassion means with passion not only your own sense of passion, but connecting with others' experience of, of passion, including uh, positive passion and suffering. So it's empathy, but it's not enmeshed empathy. It's connectedness, it's resonating, it's rapport, but it's not getting bogged down in, trapped. It involves non-judgmental, clear awareness. And skillful reaching out, and another thing, which I think is less talked about in this day of evidence-based practice and outcomes measures, is caring non-attachment to the fruits of actions. Oh my gosh, you don't care what are the results of your interventions? Oh, terrible social work. Uh, that's, that's me. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, that doesn't literally mean you don't care whether there's any benefit or not or whether anybody's harmed. I don't mean that literally. But you're not egoistically attached to the outcomes. If what you do in the moment, in the process, in the relationship has its inherent, intrinsic value and benefit, that is crucial. Nobody can control outcomes, actually. Who knows? Maybe even whatever your measure is, say this client had a great outcome and a half an hour later, something terrible happens to them. You can't control something like that. Or they make a, ma a bad decision. You, you, you don't know. So um, there's some paradox to that. So compassion, it's not just, it, I'm not talking about pity, but a non-judgmental, clear awareness, an engagement, skillful reaching out. So I'd like to give a couple of images to 
relate to that. On the right <clears throat> is one familiar to me from growing up as a Catholic. Uh, although the, the paintings of the Sacred Heart of Jesus I usually saw were much, you know, more pious looking. This was a street mural uh, I, I saw in Chicago once. I thought it was, was pretty cool. But what it's prominently showing the heart, the, bla the blazing heart. In fact, I kind of wondered about this, this saying sometimes used as an insult, bleeding heart liberal. I'm, uh, maybe, maybe Jesus is a bleeding heart liberal. I'm not sure, but I kind of li I, I like to think so. <laughs> but the idea there is that, that heart connection, and there's two meanings of it. One is Jesus' own experience of, of suffering and, and uh, uh, the transformation of suffering, but also being connected with others and wanting to, to, uh, to care and help others. On the left side is from the Mahayana Buddhist tradition. Uh, in particular, this is from Korea. <coughs> this is a painting of Kuan Yin, it's most often known as Kuan Yin in uh, Western writings, that's from Chinese, it's Kuan Siam Bolsal in Korean. Kuan Siam, that, that word is very interesting, if the root words come of it coming from Chinese, it means to hear the cries of the world. So this is a bodhisattva, a bodhisattva is a being who has a level of enlightenment such that <clears throat> he or she can Uh, act to help others with compassion without being attached to it and also has even a choice to stay connected in this realm of existence rather than uh, uh, simply merging in nirvana. So a bodhisattva says, and it takes a vow like, I vow to save all sentient beings from suffering as long as it takes, which might, by the way, be billions of years. That's a pretty serious vow, not just human beings. So in this painting, I'm not sure if you can make it out, but in the center, the figure is uh, standing like this and has some hands holding different implements, not only here, but all around reaching out. Each hand has a different tool. The tool means reaching out with the skillful method to deal with each situation just as needed. There's also an eye in the palm of every hand. That means being able to perceive what creatures need, what they experience in all directions. And the heads on top are looking all around and each one has a different facial expression that reflects a different feeling because all different kinds of situations evoke different feelings, but these are non-egoistic reactions. So this is a symbol of <clears throat> an open, expansive awareness of, uh, of suffering, of need and being able to reach out in a skillful way to address it. So actually in uh, Korean Buddhism, uh, for Korean Buddhist social workers, some people use this as a metaphor for uh, good social work. By the way, that can be overwhelming to think, oh my gosh, how could I possibly achieve that? But right now, if you, if you look around the room, all the people here, if all of us are paying attention compassionately and reaching out to help here and as we go out of the room, we are collectively like that bodhisattva. So it's not just one person has to do that. Just for a moment, I'd like you to do a little self-reflection exercise just as I say the questions, think about it to yourself, maybe think about it later. Some of you may just recently be coming into the field of social work or another profession that's allied. Some of you may have been in it for a long time. In any case, think back to why you decided to become a social worker or enter into your, your profession. Where did the motivation come from? Were there any mentors, relatives, friends, exemplars, or spiritual ideals that inspired you? Was there any key event that triggered your sense of compassion and dedication to serve? In any case, how can you keep that sense of initial inspiration and motivation alive now? So sometimes we, we get some enthusiasm, some really strong sense of our calling and what we're about, but that dwindles later. We lose it, or even we burn out. And so paying attention to your own spiritual development is also very important because it helps keep our, our inspiration alive. I'd like to now uh, touch a little bit on <clears throat> 
some, believe it or not, evidence-based <laughs> practices, despite what I said about outcomes before. So actually, this area of research has expanded incredibly in the last 15 years in social work and medicine and nursing and psychology and psychiatry. I can't even keep up with it all anymore. Um, an overall picture that's emerging is that people who are drawing on spirituality and religion tend to have an enhanced capacity for dealing with crises, for resilience, for recovery. Uh, of course, that varies on individuals, but that's kind of a big picture. Uh, but there are a few specific kinds of practices that have been really strongly studied and supported lately. One is the therapeutic relationship or therapeutic alliance. That's a long-term uh, commitment in social work, of course, and it turns out that the values that we usually promote are well supported. So across many, many kinds of therapeutic approaches, it seems that uh, a common factor that accounts for a large amount of beneficial change as perceived by clients is the quality of the helping relationship. If clients perceive a sense of rapport, empathy, compassion, and perceived support and alliance, they tend to report better outcomes and greater satisfaction with that helping process. Another important ingredient is installation of hope and sense of meaning that people tend to have better outcomes when there's a, I don't mean false hope, uh, but a, a, a genuine sense of hope and sense of meaning. Uh, another thing that's more skill-based is mindfulness practices. <coughs> In the mental health field, this has become really quite widely used and also in the health field. So in health, John Kabat-Zinn's mindfulness-based stress reduction therapy has been used uh, with um, uh, people who have diagnoses of cancer and other serious uh, chronic or potentially terminal illnesses. And in the mental health field, uh, Marsha Linehan developed uh, dialectical behavior therapy that includes a mindfulness component added to more traditional cognitive behavioral therapeutic techniques. So what, what these practices have in common is a lot like what I was describing before about becoming centered. It, it teaches people how to become non-judgmentally aware in the present moment without being attached or overwhelmed by it. So when people learn that, <clears throat> it, can, it can help create sort of a space within consciousness between an initial experience and your reaction to it. So let's say somebody is, uh, let's say a teenager, uh, a teenage boy in, the, in a schoolyard, somebody uh, uh, insults him. And maybe his immediate reaction is to feel anger and strike out. But with mindfulness practice, you learn to observe the cue, the immediate anger cue inside some thought or feeling, it's like a tiny seed. And before it's able to sprout and grow, you can, inter you can internally observe it, non-judgmentally be aware of it, relax, let it go, and then respond with a clear mind. Uh, so this has been used, uh, uh, initially it was used uh, in mental health to help people with suicidal ideation to prevent uh, actually committing suicide as widely used for people who are diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and has been expanded to a lot of things of anxiety, depression, and other, uh, and other things. So uh, there's a lot of, this is an area of a lot of study that's quite interesting. Um, even some of these practices have been manualized, you know, so you can have consistent training of techniques and people can consistently learn them. Now I think actually all of that is great and it's been opening up more interest around spiritually uh, sensitive practice. But there is something to pay attention to, that by taking it out of the original context, mindfulness practices, uh, Marshall Linehan and John Kabat-Zinn and others adapted them from Zen Buddhism and Vipassana. Those meditation traditions include mindfulness practices, al along with other things. Those purposes are, to, are for seeking enlightenment, not reducing symptoms of anxiety or depression or something like that. And actually in that context, your anxiety can start going way up when you're getting into some deep existential questions like, 
a common uh, internal meditation mantra in Zen is, uh, what am I? And if you're on a retreat, you're meditating on that for 16 hours a day. You know, that can provoke some anxiety. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, I think it's great that's being used for these purposes, but we have to remember taking it out of the context and using it for different purposes, it changes it. So, even just for ourselves to prevent burnout, which, which we all know is, a <clears throat> is an occupational hazard and stress-related uh, difficulties, physical and emotional. Uh, how can we uh, uh, avoid stress and burnout around internal confusion, overwork, indirect traumatization, inhumane or dangerous work conditions, inhumane ways of relating with clients, existential angst, imbalanced empathy? And, oh, gee, if you're just getting into social work, I hope I'm not <laughs> discouraging <laughs> you. <laughs> But, you know, one, one interesting thing is that even situations of stress can be opportunities for growth. Stress actually can be distress, which is what we usually mean by the word, but it also could be eustress, E-U stress. That means good stress. When we're having fun, when we're engaged in a creative activity that we're really excited about, Maybe we're not sitting there quietly relaxed, our breath is nice and smooth. Maybe, wow, you know, our heart's pumping, we're really into it. That can also be uh, centered. But eustress involved that sense that it's a positive, enjoyable, exhilarating kind of stress. But even too much of that we can burn out from. But stress can be converted to eustress, or even the feeling of distress can be dissolved when we learn to practice uh, breathing, meditation, mindfulness, so we can convert constrained or misdirected energy into freely flowing enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is the other side of anxiety. Anxiety is great because there's a whole lot of energy there, but it's stuck, it's pent up, it's, you know, our muscles are tight, our breathing is constricted, it's, but when it can become loosened up and generated and flowing, then there's enthusiasm there. <clears throat> so, you know, remember to stretch and breathe, and consider what kind of practices do you regularly do? Do you regularly, daily, <clears throat> do any practices that help to prevent distress, promote you stress, help you relax, to center, to re-energize? Well, maybe it's jogging. Uh, maybe it's going, it's doing a religious practice. Maybe it's prayer, maybe it's meditation, maybe it's talking with children. Whatever it is, if you can do it in a mindful way, it's very important for regenerizing. Re if not, <clears throat> we're like, we're like batteries. And as we go through our life doing things with our personal life, with our professional work, our energy is running down as a closed system. We have to tap in to the connectedness with others, with the universe, so that the energy is con continually flowing and, and replenishing. Now take this on a larger scale. <clears throat> in social work and the human services, the faith-based initiatives are uh, a big federal-oriented uh, approach that's affecting uh, religion and spirituality and practice and also has a lot of controversy around it. So by the way, NESW has a policy statement about that, which I'm just going to highlight a point for the sake of time, and if you're interested, you can go on their website. So this uh, policy says that faith-based entities can receive governmental funds and provide services while retaining a religious character. Exactly how that works is where some controversy comes in. Uh, and NESW recognizes the, the important history of charitable organizations and social work religious collaborations. There's no dispute there, and that can be valuable. <coughs> but it does raise concern to be sure that in that process, at least insofar as, as professional social workers are engaged with it, that uh, clients have uh, voluntary access to services without discrimination. There needs to be accountability and transparency in the delivery of services, appropriate and qualified staffing. Volunteers are wonderful and it's fantastic when volunteers uh, are, are helping. But if volunteers or untrained staff are getting involved with client issues that might involve danger to self and others or require skills that go beyond just common sense, that's dangerous. Separation of church and state and maintaining government responsibility are also important issues they raise.
so cultural competence is, an, is a big buzzword, getting more and more common in social work these days. I see spiritually sensitive practices being allied with that, <clears throat> but I also see it as a process, not an end state. You don't just take a quiz and get 80% defi- decide you passed in cultural competency or something. It's your life is totally engaged in a, in a process of growth and transformation through intercultural, interreligious, interspiritual interactions and collaborations. For the sake of time, I'm just going to toss out one idea from this mandala. <clears throat> so if, if you imagine those four colored circles, and if we were going to be realistic, there would be hundreds or thousands of them to represent different cultural contacts we might interact with, we can learn certain s- skills to connect and help mediate between them. <clears throat> but it's actually practically quite difficult even to become thoroughly bilingual and bicultural between two settings. To do it with multiple is even harder. So um, one way of helping to address that besides learning, having the right values, having certain skills that you learn, is when you're centered, you're connected with who you really are in that deep way that you sense the connectedness and inherent uh, oneness with others. That center point is where all of those diversities actually connect. So if we can relate with that from that point, um, people often sense that. And it also helps us to feel more open and fluid and flexible. And the larger circle, which encompasses all of the differences, is a mode of consciousness and behavior that includes, respects diversity and difference, but also transcends that. To put it on a practical level, we need to engage in collaborations within our agencies and across agencies and community systems and universities and all sorts of support systems so that we have multicultural, <clears throat> multi-spiritual support systems collaborating, connected up, networked, and collaborating. That's when we can really be multicultural. It's, it's sort of like the, I said about Guanxi and Bosal. One person cannot meaningfully, skillfully connect with all possible spiritual and cultural variations you might encounter in a place like Boston. You can, you can be prepared for that, but you need to be engaged in collaboration uh, and active networking. By the way, if you're interested in a, a lot of resources, aside from uh, the book there that I've listed, on my homepage, there's a lot of links, not just to my work, but to literally hundreds of resources, uh, internet sites, uh, <clears throat> essays, bibliographies, photo galleries, all sorts of things that can provide resources around this topic. So for the sake of time, I think I'd better stop there and see if I can take a question or two. And please stop as soon as we need to. OK. The question or comment? Yes. Can you say a little bit more about asking for a glass of water in a spiritual cultural yes. context? <laughs> well, as- aside from that story I told, I'll I'll just I'll just riff <laughs> on it. Well, I'm wondering my, as you as you spoke of that, I was <clears throat> thinking that it was a great intervention uh-huh. because you said that. It was their tradition to offer something. Uh-huh. They were in an argument. They didn't offer anything. Uh-huh. And you interrupted. You, you reminded them of themselves. Yeah. yeah, that's true. And also me. I reminded myself of myself. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Very practical. In fact, uh, <clears throat> my wife is a medical social worker. So she's every day, and most of the time in the emergency room, she's really needs to practice how to be centered through all that. That's pretty intense. Ten hours a day she, she works. So she likes to use the, this example of a glass of water from, <clears throat> from Zen practice. Um, in, in Zen practice, there's a tradition where the student goes to the teacher and there's a kind of interaction, a dialogue. This, the teacher may ask some questions that sound paradoxical, a little, little str- or strange, and you, your response is supposed to indicate kind of the quality of your, your own practice. So one common question <clears throat> is, uh, <clears throat> holding up a glass of water and saying, uh, what is this? And commonly the student says, well, that's a glass of water. No, no, <coughs> all wrong. Uh, and then you're, what, what am I supposed to say? What's the <laughs> I'm stuck. Well, that's the point. You're supposed to get stuck. So one answer that 
<laughs> is often agreeable, <laughs> is pick up the glass and take a sip. That's just showing directly and practically without a bunch of mental stuff getting in the way. That's just what it is in, in that moment. That's a, another feature of being centered, you know, cutting through all of the mental jumbling, rumbling around and just being right there in that situation. Uh, and so that literally, in that case, it was with a glass of water. Yes? I relate that to um, Kleenex when someone's crying. <laughs> yeah, do you good. offer a Kleenex and break what's happening? Uh -huh. Or do you not? <laughs> that's right. <It's clears throat> Uh, especially if the Kleenex are perfumed and they have a scent allergy. So there are a lot of practical things <laughs> to consider. <laughs> Another common question? Yes? I uh, was talking with a person very close to me and they said that, uh, we were talking about social work, and that uh, spirituality has so many definitions that it's an absolutely useless term. Mm. No, my visceral reaction was very strong because it's a very, you know, meaningful term to me. Mm -hmm. But it struck me, it's, it can be useless in that sense, but it also is deeply meaningful. So I was just a little curious as to how you would sort of react to a comment like that. Uh, well, I guess I'd ask what's their definition of spirituality and whether it's useful or useless. So, um, in the one sense, because it's such a complex and rich concept, people are going to have a lot of different ways of understanding it, and that kind of, in a way, points to the significance of it. <clears throat> in a practical level, <clears throat> you do have to, if you're, let's say in research, you have to come up, depending on the kind of research, with a clear enough definition to guide the research, but if it's a qualitative study, you can have a kind of open starting definition, and then you can discover from the participants what do they actually mean, or maybe they don't even use the word, or with clients. I'm not suggesting that in an assessment process you start, well, oh, here's Ed Camden's slide that tells you the definition of spirituality. No, but you use some words that, in the opening question, that touch on spirituality, religion, faith, or meaning, or purpose, something that opens up an opportunity for the client to respond, and then you listen to the cues. What words are they using to describe and name this territory, you might say? And then follow up on their words, and from that you, you continue uh, to go down that road. That's a more client-centered or ethnographic way of doing it. Um, so to me, the definition for many purposes is not as important as just so we understand the territory we want to go into. You open it up and then you follow wherever it goes, however it goes. <clears throat> In some languages, it's even hard to translate spirituality as I've defined it here. Well, that's another story. But there are ways of, of getting at it, even with that. Um, in other kinds of research, then you may have to have a very operational definition tied to measures. So it depends kind of on the context. Okay. Thank, you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat>